Look at, just the other day, uh, a letter that appeared in the Globe and Mail. You know, we've been talking about how we came to be in Canada, how we came perhaps as pioneers, men in sheepskin coats, or later as political exiles, or later as displaced persons. But in fact, we weren't the only ones coming to Canada. There were people coming in to Canada who believed that there was no such thing as a Ukraine, who didn't want there to be a free Ukraine. And those people are still out there now. I'll give you an exact example from the 3rd of December 2009, just last week, Globe and Mail. There was a story about John Demenuk. I'm not going to go into the story. And I decided I'd have a little fun with it, so I wrote a letter. And uh, the, the title of the piece was, A Bizarre Showpiece as Germany Confronts Its Past. And I wrote, how can the Germans be confronting their Nazi past by trying a Ukrainian American? <laughs> right? So, got to punch it. But, in that same column, there was another letter from Giselle Schnachter of Toronto. And I'm not going to read the whole letter, but she basically says that she'd like to share her father's memory as an inmate of the death camps. And apparently this gentleman was arrested in September 1944, and he went first to Auschwitz, then to Bergen-Belsen and Dachau, from which she says he was liberated in March 1945. He told me that by far the most dreaded in forces in the camps were the Ukrainians. Right? So, there's two problems with this. One, I'm sure you all sense. The most dreaded enforcers in the camps were Ukrainians, so there is a stereotype of Ukrainians being put on the top column of the Globe and Mail, Canada's national newspaper of record, and some of your neighbors and friends and business associates read this and go, oh, well, you know, he may be an okay guy, this, these people are right, but boy, they come from that kind of, uh, of a community. The trouble with her letter, as I pointed out to the editor, but they didn't run my response to her, was that Auschwitz was liberated in January of 1945. Bergen-Belsen and Dachau were liberated in uh, April of 1945. So how was he released in March of 1945 unless the Germans let him go? <laughs> Some problem with that story. So my guess is that she just doesn't know her own father's history, quite frankly. I think this is just an honest mistake. But there's no correction. And so the reading public gets this kind of cute little punch at the Germans from me, and then gets this letter from the descendant of a Holocaust survivor who says the worst people were the Ukrainians. Now, this leads me to suggest to you that we are in a rather poor shape as a community in Canada. Cook has a motto, in unity is our strength, but I would argue that we have very, very little unity. Uh, we have very little coordination, and that's no fault, by the way, of Pablo Grod. I know he's been trying. But we have no, dare I say it, five-year plan. Uh, we are not engaging. He just wrote down five-year plan. <laughs> <laughs> and I think he wrote, thanks, Joe. <laughs> we have no coordination. Very few, although there are some exceptions, of the fourth wave are engaged. Few of our children or our children's children are involved. Why do we not have a community that really, really does represent 1.2 million people? So then that raises the question, what is our cause here? And is it the cause of Ukrainian independence? No, that's done. Is it the cause of Ukrainian freedom? I think that's still a cause that some of us, a minority of a minority, will engage in, but it's a difficult struggle, and it shows no prospect of ending anytime soon. But there's a third kind of thing. And this is the thing that, I know what this is going to sound like, but I'm going to say it anyway. What's in it for me? What's in it for me to be a Canadian who identifies himself as a person of Ukrainian heritage? What are our interests, our collective interests as a community that has a historical experience, but is tied together by common interests looking forward? Well, you might say, well, we want to defend the good name of Ukrainians. We want to make sure that Ukraine is not defamed because, of course, that has some impact on our lives. And as I've said to you, we have to deal with people for whom there is no such thing as Ukraine or people who want to uh, denounce and defame the struggle that many of our parents or grandparents engaged in for Ukrainian independence. We have within our own ranks, and I'm sure you all can think of a few, self-loathing Ukrainians who will do anything they can to prove their objectivity by spitting on their own community. We have lots of Uncle Toms, we have lots of know-nothings and do-nothings. And let me give you a few examples, because I love to pick on other people. Um, as a member of the Ukrainian-Canadian Civil Liberties Association, um, 
I'm very proud to say that after a struggle of some 20 odd years, uh, our very small group, with the assistance of the Ukraine Canadian Congress and the Ukrainian Canadian Foundation of Tarashevchenko in the last few years of that effort, uh, was able to secure what has come to be known as the Canadian First World War Internment Recognition Fund. So we secured the sum of $10 million. That $10 million is deposited with the Shevchenko Foundation. And that $10 million, the interest earned on it for the next 15 years, well, it's about 13 years now, will be used to commemorate and educate about what happened to Ukrainians and other Europeans during Canada's first national internment operations. It's an inclusive endowment in the sense that we have Hungarian and Croatian and Serbian representatives and other communities will be affected, who were affected will be on our council over the next several years. We have an attorney descendant and so on. But at the end of the 15 years, all of that $10 million, because we're not allowed to spend the principal, will come back to the Ukrainian Canadian Foundation of Tarashevchenko and will be our money. So, for 10, 12, 13 more years, we have to share with other communities who, frankly, are taking our lead and supporting us. There's really no tension. In fact, some of them I have more fun working with than my own. Um, but at the end, the Ukrainian Canadian Civil Liberties Association and its supporters and friends secured for our community $10 million. And in fact, if you want to know more about it, some of you picked up this poster, you can find the website and information about what you need to do uh, to access some of those funds if you're so inclined. Um, so we enriched the community because we were prepared to go out, not with a begging bowl and ask politely, but we went out and were assertive in making the case that Ukrainians and other Europeans had been hard done by and deserved recognition and a restitution. And there were many people in our community, none of them in this room, uh, that I can see anyway, who at the beginning of that campaign said, you know, who gave you permission to raise this issue? Why are you raising that issue? This is embarrassing. This is going to cause us problems. Don't do this. You know, we don't want you to raise this issue. Forget about it. Bury it. We didn't listen. We raised $10 million. Now, Compare that to what happened about a decade ago. 1891, 1991 was the centennial of Ukrainian settlement in Canada. The government of Canada, Ujavamjaku, gave us $1 million to celebrate the centennial. So after 100 years, we're worth a million bucks. We had some banquets, I hear. I don't know what happened to the money. I don't see that much actually came out of that money that did any good to the organized community. We're coming up to the 120th anniversary. Pavlovia, I've got you in my sights. You shouldn't have come up here. <laughs> what are we asking now of the government of Canada for the 120th anniversary? If a group of people, Oyla Grod, Slavko Grod, Natalka Wilson, myself, Boris Sidorik, and a few others across Canada organized into UCLA, a very small band of people, could struggle for 20 years and get $10 million. I expect the organized Ukrainian community is represented by our Congress to get a lot more for the 120th anniversary and to do something useful with it. Now, what about again, Ukraine? Shouldn't they finally, a nation of 50 million people, uh, well, 47 when you count the ones that are in Portugal, um, shouldn't a nation of several tens of millions of people be able to help the diaspora? Isn't it their turn for a change after plus 100 plus years of our effort? What have they done for us lately? Well, you may remember that a few weeks ago, the government of Ukraine and Kiev announced 47 million, sounds like a lot, hryvni were being given to support the diaspora. That works out to about 6.2 million Canadian dollars. I asked the other day, December 9th, so where's the money? It's coming. <laughs> Checks in the mail, right? <laughs> uh, there's no money. We're not getting any. Now, the diaspora is a big thing. Obviously, some of this money could be going to Ukrainians in Russia, and I'm not against it. I'm not against money going to the diaspora in Portugal. I'm not against the money being used however they think it best be used. We don't even need the money, you might say, in Canada, and you're all right. But the fact is, they made a promise, and I don't think they've delivered on it. I don't think they even intend to. Not a penny has been provided of that promise. Support. So, my answer is, we here cannot wait on them over there. 